C'est bon. show how we can reconstruct a heritage, make even an anthology, a lexicon. We had also a part about Pollux, Onomastica, and children's games, and this is published now. Uh, the book is out, and we are very happy of that after the two years as planned. And then a lot of discussion about play, games, and education, and again, here a few publications are out, and a full uh, <coughs> issue of a journal will be out this year about it. Archaeology is uh, the other topic, and very extensive topic, because we want to spatially special, recognize where are ball games, where is the material in Roman towns, east and west, so comparing Rome and comparing Ephesus, Aphrodisias, but also understanding what, what, what is the role of games and game devices in liminal places, such as tombs and sanctuaries. At the moment, we are in the middle of the first part, and uh, as you will see. Iconography is another very important part of play and the construction of social identity. Hannah Amar is in charge of the part about children as social actors, and we also all work, work about it. And then games as the fabric of gender, and Alexandra Atia is working on iconography of South Italy, where play and gender are a very important issue. We also reconstructed games, and this part now is over, and we may have time to make a demonstration at the end of the day or at the round table. Uh, with Vienna, with the uh, University of Applied Arts and Gentle Troll Company, uh, with Gentle Troll Company, with Bente Kramay, Ludus Afunculorum, Duodecim Scripta, and the Freeman's Morris. Uh, and the light also as a way of the iconography, so just a short glimpse of how it looks like. And you have always two versions of the games. And uh, we plan to have as many translations of the rules as, as is possible. Already now, thanks to the team, we have it in English, Italian, German, <coughs> and the French. So this is also associated with a database. And we come to what is the aim of the day. The database recording all ancient board games in the ancient world, which will, of course, produce unexpected results and may help us to date, to date the practice and to map the diffusion of the practice. And that's why we invited Cameron Brown in order to, to work together. Uh, and so producing, producing that map, so that, that's, that's our meeting. We already had a meeting with Tim Penn and, uh, and um, Sam Accords. They did an extensive work about Roman Britain. We met last December, and they will introduce their games for Roman Britain with the question, are these games cultural markers, or are they something else? I mean, are they uh, a way of understanding the diffusion of romanization? And they will soon introduce their board games in our database. An example of diffusion is the extensive work done by, being done by Ulrich Schädler about a fantastic find by Carol Pieta, uh, soon, soon out, about a late 4th century chamber grave from Poprat. So we are really at the border of the Roman world and in a position where we see that a young prince 
went to Rome, and what did he bring back as a sign of romanization? A board game that is being studied. So that's something very important. Now, a big question we have to address, entering the database, and this we will also discuss uh, with Alessandro Pace, who is in charge of this database, how to identify games. At the moment, the only typology we have is that established by Charlotte Rouge, which is fantastic, it's very extensive, but it doesn't include just games, it includes other devices. But you will see how our database is structured. And one of the outcome we hope of our database is to produce such kind of map, huh? so showing the distribution of board games in a town. Here it was uh, made just as a game uh, for the exhibition. The town of Ephesus, when you click, you can see what kind of game. Uh, a change in urban, urban, uh, I didn't finish the sentence, urban, they said use, urban space, uh, yeah. habits. Uh, what, what does it mean when you have suddenly, suddenly, when, when you have all these board games carved on the floor? Here you have two temples, in fact, the Dim uh, and uh, the Parthenon in Athens. Does it mean that the temple is no more used? Does it mean a change? Is it only late antiquity that they appear? This also may, may come out, because in Pompeii we have a big question, we don't find them. So it may mean that they appear at a certain stage in the life of a town, and it's after, for instance, the time of Pompeii. But we know that they were performed in public spaces. Uh, Uwe Scheller already worked extensively uh, about it. We see here in this, in this mosaic how important is, is the presence of, of board games. Now we made these roofs, but of course uh, for the reconstruction, and this is also something that we will debate. Uh, may, making this map may allow us to understand how not only the practice was established, but if it evolved, if there were changes. And um, for us, what is interesting too is what is behind, uh, is behind social rules. Uh, what does it mean when, when you have this romanization through the games? Is an ideology transmitted and hence social rules established? And if the games themselves and the rules themselves may escape to us, other elements around, uh, such as inscription of the board game, may help us understand better these social rules. So just to show who is here, on uh, Skype we have uh, Elton Barker, who, who is part of the Pelagios network, the Pelagios team. He's at the Open University now, and we will soon next uh, have him online. And he will show us what are the aims of his big project on ancient, ancient geographies. We're very happy also to welcome Cameron Brown with the Digital Reading Project because we are very close, mapping traditional games, <coughs> finding uh, the ADN, the DNA <laughs> of them, the stemata, I would say, philologists, and map, of course, from Toulouse, with whom we have we have already many contacts, mapping mapping ancient polytheism. So another topic, but also another problematic, but similar questions about cartography, and of course Ludi, Locus Ludi, and the Pompeii project. Uh, so how, how mm, in, as a kind of case study, how can we do it? And we have also here uh, Thomas Daniel, who is part of our team, and a PhD student uh, studying uh, Roman Gaul and mapping Roman Gaul, and then we also benefit from all that we find now. So I will not be too long, just because we want to hear you all. And uh, we are next trying to meet Elton Barker. According to a little noise, he must be there. So I try first to call him. Elton, well, I call him. And then we will connect with the PowerPoint. Hello, Elton. Hello, Veronique. Ah, you see me, that's not very interesting. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How can I? Uh, ah, fantastic. Okay. Hello. You went. Hello. So, Hello. I, maybe introduce yourself. You are at the Open University? That's correct, yes. I'm at the Open University. I'm, um, uh, my full title is a reader in classical studies at the Open University, so I do ancient Greek stuff generally. So, my day job um, is really often reading Homer. Um, a home, um, a home is kind of uh, one of my big passions. But this other side of my 
job or interest has taken me into the world of digital plastics and specifically uh, this idea of trying to um, explore the geog ancient geographies uh, through digital methods and connected to that um, this initiative called Plagios which is about trying to connect online resources to do with place. Uh, so the, the, I, I will talk about both. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, maybe we pass to your PowerPoint. Yes, yes. let me see. If and we will see, I don't think we can still show you when I project it, but we will hear you. Huh? We, we make a try. Mm -hmm. Okay. Try. Can you see my PowerPoint? Ah, you do it. Yes, I'm okay. Right. Let's see. <laughs> okay. 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 Yes, yes. We, we see your PowerPoint, but it's little. And now? Is it big? That's okay. It's better, huh? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is that okay? Yes, I think so. So go. Okay. Let, let's go. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, the, the title of my talk: Mapping Ancient Geographies. And I'm, um, yeah, looking at your program, I was trying to pick out things related to projects that I've been working on and are still working on that could be useful. So I'm going to talk about uh, three issues regarding mapping texts, um, the process of annotation, and then finally this idea of linked data. Um, first of all, I think it might be useful just um, as, a, as a kind of icebreaker is to ask you in the room there, see, can you identify what this map is of? <laughs> No. I can anyone? I can, anyone can anyone tell me what this map is representing? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I still use a computer. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I wanted to start with this slide because it gives reason for thinking why we might want to explore uh, different geographic traditions other than our own, particularly those pre-Cartesia. So this is from the Book of Curiosities. It's an Arabic map, uh, probably produced in Egypt in around 11th, 12th century um, AD. And those circles that you see around are annotations done within this platform of Rebel Gita that I'm going to be showing you in a minute. And once you've done those annotations, you can then map it, you can, and then you can see that the map is actually a map of the Mediterranean which yeah, f from this very schematic representation is very difficult to tell. So this is kind of the idea of why we might, why we might be interested in thinking about and representing uh, pre-Cartesian geography. It gives us a different way of looking at space, our own spaces, and perhaps provides an insight into the cognitive spatial apparatus that previous geographic traditions had. But that's not my world. The medieval world is not my world. So what I want to do very briefly is to take you through my world, looking at um, looking at these three issues that I talked about, whilst weaving in and out of various projects that I'm working on. So the first uh, five minutes will be about Herodotus and trying to map Herodotus, so taking a text essentially and trying to create a map out of a text, or maps out of a text rather. Then, secondly, I want to talk a little bit about Pausanias and the process of how you can, one can go about trying to um, identify and um, give more information about places within a text. And then thirdly, very briefly, um, the initiative I talked about, Pelagios, which is trying to connect online resources so that then we can go from one particular resource, which, be, which might be my work on Pausanias, to your work on, on, on games, for example. So how can we move between different um, resources online? But again, uh, why might we want to turn to Herodotus anyway for thinking about geography? Well, here's a very nice example. Let me see if I can move my box in there. So this is in, more or less in the middle of the histories, where Herodotus turns to consider the extent of the, the Persian Empire, and he explicitly draws attention to mapping traditions, um, contemporary mapping traditions, and the problem with them. You know, I laugh to see how many have before now drawn maps of the world. The issue for Herodotus seems to be the, the schematization, the, 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 the balanced representations that these maps provide. So this, 
this is an invitation, I think, to read his text uh, spatially and to think how text, and particularly his narrative, organizes space. So that was really you know, the primary focus of this project that I was working on called Hestia, trying to uh, explore, if you like, um, Herodotus's counter-cartographic impulse. Now, one thing you might want to do is nevertheless map the histories, and so this is, a, this is the places in the histories in the GIS. I won't go into any detail really regarding this, only to, I think, you see at a glance that although Herodotus' uh, geographic scope is quite broad, he goes you know, as far west as the Tin Islands, as far east as you know, uh, India, the real primary focus of the histories is concentrated around the Aegean, and there you can see the, the red dots as, are representing settlements. And that as you move out from the, from the Aegean, and more generally the Mediterranean, you encounter fewer and fewer places, and particularly settlements. So natural features become a big issue, for example. So natural features here are represented in blue. So as you go into Scythia, very little, there's not much of a human footprint. What you get are descriptions of rivers and mountains, etc. So this is just a very quick representation. But this is not what we wanted to do. You know, what precisely what we didn't want to do was to plug Herodotus into our own technology, into our own um, uh, conceptual framing of the text. We wanted to go back to the narrative and try to, try to see how space and issues of space emerge from the way he wanted to put his narrative together. And it seemed to us that two things became important over and above the identification of a place. And those are the things I've highlighted in this slide. They are proxies. So it's very striking when you compare the Greek text to the, the English text, how often in the, in the the English text, there's already a process of translation going on. So where, where in English we might talk, for example, about Persia and Athens coming into conflict, if you look at the Greek, it's Herodotus who talk about Persians and the Athenians. It becomes, so he talks about people and peoples rather than places. So it seems to, but nevertheless, those peoples, as the English translation implies, have a spatial Ness to them, a spatiality to them. So it seemed to us that um, in addition to trying to identify places and place names, we should think about peoples and try to represent, try to capture people information when they're represented places. And here, you know, I just give an example of the beginning of Book 5, where the first place settlement that's mentioned um, is Corinthus, and yet before then, um, Herodotus just talks about Darius being in Europe, the Persians whom Darius left behind in Europe. So it's an important spatial element to that. The Persians are occupying Europe, and we wanted to capture that. And the second thing is, and this is really fundamental, is that we wanted to think how narrative organizes space differently from cartographic representation. And it seemed to us that um, how that was communicated, how space was represented in the world it was through relations, place relations. And here I give just another um, illustrative passage, how Herodotus will talk about Uneti on the Adriatic Sea, they themselves call themselves colonists from Medea, um, however that may be, the Liges who dwell inland in Massalia use the word Sigenai, perhaps the Cyprians use it for spears. So just in a couple of sentences, Herodotus crisscrosses back and forth across the Mediterranean. So this, he, the way that places are being put together here are not necessarily uh, proximate, as one might, might imagine from look, having a bird's eye view of these places. They're being put together conceptually. So in other words, we were creating network maps, essentially, from thinking about Herodotus. And as soon as you mention a network map, you get something like this. The, the hairball or the spaghetti monster, um, which no network uh, talk can do without. We always need a spaghetti monster in a network visualization tool. What this is showing you is how complex the data are in the world. This is, we are only looking at book five, but it was really very complex um, looking at, um, in total, the network relations in book five. So that, that's, if you like, a warning, a health warning. 
Um, and then a visualization here to show how we clean things up a little so that you can then start to make sense. So Persia being at the center of this world, not the, the Aegean before, but Persia being, so now we're, now the world is being organized around action and influence rather than topographic representation. So the places are mentioned, or the peoples mentioned most often and in relation to others are at the center of this network. So now Persia becomes, if you like, the dominant force, and you see the relationships between Persia and Miletus, um, Athens and Sparta. So you start to get um, uh, crystallizations or, or, or tessellations of, of relations. I'll leave it there regarding the Hestia project, but that's kind of where we were going. We're trying to think how narrative organizes space differently. And now I want to kind of show things um, if you like, in action. So all of that was done by hand. We had an Excel spreadsheet, we read through the brief text, and we were just marking the relations between the places that we found, so just in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, then Plagios came along, which was, as I've said, trying to connect online resources, and one way in which we, we, we identified a need was enabling people to do that themselves. So rather than always relying upon technical people and coders, and here, you know, I should have, I should have really said this at the beginning, I'm not a technical person, I'm not a coder, I'm a classicist. We developed a, pro, a, a platform, a tool, to enable anybody, the researcher, the data curator, the librarian, to be able to work on their materials directly and produce linked data. But Replicator, which is this platform, has become much more. I just want to show you briefly how it works in relation to another project. This other project is we've moved on from the auditors, or I have at least, trying to, and I'm now working on Pausanias, which is, a, is essentially a text all about place and places and how you move through space. This is the beginning of Pausanias, and I just want to take you through what we're doing here. In and we use we now have this we now have this um, digital platform to work with to be able to um, enrich our reading of Pausanias. And we're enriching our reading of Pausanias through what are called annotations, essentially just making notes on on the text directly. Um, and in particular, we're interested in places. And there's a two-step process when you're working in Red Gita, and you've, you've got a text like this. You first of all identify a character string in the text that you identify as a place. So here I've identified the Sunium commentary. I understand that that's a place. I highlight that. And then the second step is Red Gita gives you a pop-up box, and it gives you um, a list of places on a map using uh, gazetteers, so data, uh, basically databases of places, and then I align my uh, place in my document to this authority file, to the gazetteer. So here I've done that, so you've got the pop-up box, I've highlighted the Sunni commentary here, um, I've aligned it to this gazetteer entry from Topper's text, um, and I've also put a couple of tags in, the tags could be useful for uh, disambiguated between different kinds of place, settlements, for example, from physical features, etc. And then I press OK. What I've done there, I've then annotated a place, and if you're interested in this, if you're going to publish your data openly, it, because I'm using uh, gazetteers with um, these uh, disambiguating numbers, a, basically a uniform resource identifier, URI, you, you are also producing linked data. So as well as annotating the text for place information, I'm also producing a text that can then be discovered more readily online and that can then be um, connected to other resources. But there's much more here, and it, it, it gets complicated, and this, um, this slide shows you why it's difficult to rely upon automated methods. Because as you're reading, I'm using English translation just for convenience, but as you're reading this, this is the third line, Pausanias says, for fortification was built on it. The it refers to the island of Petropolis. Now, if you're doing data mining, uh, automated, de uh, automated um, uh, matching, the computer's not going to recognize it as a place. A human reader recognizes it as a place, and what kind of place? So I've identified it as a place, and I've made the alignment to this Petropolis island from the previous clause. Um, it gets more complicated because, as you saw from, Hest from the Hestia Herodotus project, 
You might also want to think about people representing places. So in Record Gita, I can mark Patroclus as a person, because he's a person, but he's also representing a place. He's representing, in this instance, uh, the land of Egypt. And there's an important, uh, again, spatial element here to what, to what uh, Pausanias is describing, a conflict between the Egyptians and the Macedonians fought over in Athens. So I've, I've marked this, this character string both as a person, also as a place, and I've, and I've put in the tags proxy. So you, so you can then, um, at the end of the process, you can then identify all of those people who have represented places. But you can also mark other entities. So I've, I've got a couple more, just a couple more minutes. So you can um, not only mark uh, places, but also mark other entities. So here you might want to mark focalization, for example. So I've marked this whole sentence here. When you have rounded the promontory and you see a harbour, I've marked that whole sentence as focalization of the second person in Pausanias. And again, this might be something important for you, not only to identify all of those places where the second person is used in Pausanias, but maybe how places are described differently according to different focalizations. So maybe uh, for example, uh, the Athenians focalise space differently from the Spartans, um, or from when Pausanias is just talking directly to his, his reader. So that's one event you can mark. You've also seen you can also mark people. I showed you that before. You can also mark uh, movement through time. So this is um, a, another place mentioned here, Laurium. Further on is Laurium. What Pausanias is doing here, and for anyone who knows anything about Pausanias, this is kind of indicative of his work. He moves through space in a, in a hodological fashion, as if you're moving through a route. And we wanted to capture those moments. So here we've used the tag, the third tag here, to mark Pausanias um, as if he's moving through the space. So that way, again, we'll be able to bring up all of those instances where he's moving through the space and have a kind of a visualization, potentially, of him moving through those spaces. And why that's important is because, as well as moving through space, Pausanias moves through time. And we've already briefly saw that before when I was talking about sort of marking it uh, with the island of Patroclus, and Patroclus being um, a place as well as a person. That whole clause is actually movement through time. So Pausanias isn't talking about the here and now, he's talking about a previous time. And again, it's going to be very important for us in our analysis of space to be able to uh, identify and disambiguate those different movements in time as well. Again, with a view, with, a, with a, the hypothesis that uh, different periods of time will represent space differently. That's kind of what, we're, what we want to explore. So this is, I've marked this as Hellenistic time. And then we can debate the, the, um, our categories, and I think they are open for debate, but nevertheless we wanted to give this sense of a, a kind of a period that will be familiar for his readership. And lastly, um, you can also not only mark entities, but you can also mark relations. So that was that thing that we had to do by hand in the Hestia project, here you can now do it in this digital interface and can get the information. So here what I've marked, I've, I've identified um, Patroclus as an entity and the Athenians as the entity on which Patroclus is acting. And I've marked that relationship as movement, Patroclus moving to Athens, and it's also one of the lines. And you can contrast that with Antigonus, who is representing the Macedonians, um, again, the, the relationship is movement, but this time it's one that's uh, negative, it's invasion. So you can start building up um, a relational analysis of spaces as well, using this, uh, this relational uh, tagging feature in Repulgito. Now, what might all this look like? So here you have that familiar looking gis -y, uh, map um, that you saw before, but this is a map interface you get um, as it happens in Repulgito itself. But you can then click on the left-hand side here to change the color and filter settings. So you can organize that visualization by book. So you start to get to see, start to see where the, uh, the different books, they're kind of the, the focus of their, the spatial focus of those books. 
And where you see the white representations, that's where there's crossover, so that these places are mentioned in more than one book. And more importantly, you can zoom down, you can click on any of these dots, and you can get closer to the, um, the, the, the places, but you can also crucially link back to the text. So you start to bring the map and text into some kind of dialogue with each other. And this is actually an even more interesting example because we're not really using a gazetteer here. This is a this is a Judith Binder's um, art uh, historical artwork um, database of of um, artworks that were found in Athens. This is a warrior and horse sculpture that she talks about, uh, and using uh, using Repugita, we've been able to directly link the. Um, the reference in Pausanias to Judith Binder's um, uh, database. So we're starting to bring together these different resources in So you can then again not only go from the map back to the text, but you can potentially go from text to other materials that Pausanias is talking about. So you start to so you start to get this interconnection of resources based around the issue of place. And crucially, this is only the first step. What I've been we're talking about here is annotating the text, and you can also annotate a map, as you saw with that first slide I gave you. Crucially, what Recogita gives you is a whole list of different data formats, um, which you can use to get your data out and to then visualize and analyze in other more appropriate app applications. So Recogita is not going to do everything for you. Recogita is an annotation tool, first and foremost. So I mentioned relational networks, for uh, relational uh, tagging, for example. With Replicator, you can do the annotating of those relations, but then you'd want to get that out and put it into like a Gephi visualization network platform. So Replicator is a, is a part of the pipeline, part of the workflow that you might want to use. And Replicator has been developed by Pelagios, this initiative, that has recently, just in the last uh, six months, has become a, not has moved from being a project that was run by a small core team, small core team of whom I was one, to becoming an open uh, open network of partners. So, as well as linking data, Pelagios has been all about linking people. One reason why I'm here talking to you, mm -hmm. and this is an open invitation for you and for anybody in the room, anybody working uh, with. Uh, I'm working with an interest in geo annotation, geo visualization, and in linking resources to become a member, to become to become actually a partner, where you will then take a role in influencing the future direction of this initiative. That's it. And there's just some there are some resources where you, if you want, you can kind of follow up on some of the stuff I've been talking about. I hope that has been clear, not too much, and helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. If there's time or if you want to move on, that's absolutely fine. Yes, I think we will move on with uh, Cameron. Why, why, and, and uh, Ulrich uh, Schedler now will share the session and will introduce him. Uh, I think even if I take this out, we can pursue. Do you hear me? I can still hear you. Okay, so while he's uh, making the link, uh, I can ask you one or two questions. One point okay. is if I, if I understood you, so we could become partner and have links with our Ludus database, for instance, to your yes. database. That would be fantastic. Um, so one thing I want to make uh, clear here is that Pelagios isn't, doesn't hold any data, it never has done. Um, what Pelagios does is to allow people who have got data to connect their resources. Yeah. So we, Pelagios itself, its entity, doesn't have a database, but its partners okay. have the data. So you would be, yeah. so just, to, uh, this is maybe just, you know, being careful about language of or whatever, of but course. you would be enabling your data to be connected to other people in the network, yes. essentially. But what I found interesting, and we may come back to that, is that in a later stage, it is possible to connect text also with the places. And yes. when we speak of a board game, of a distribution of board games, 
We also have text talking about people playing. Uh, Marco is there, and uh, we, uh, we we discuss the problem of uh, the sanctuary of Athena when Pisistratus come. It is in Herodotus, and this would be something to think about. And an addition that would be very interesting. But an addition. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so let's pass to Cameron, and I, and, uh, I introduce the person who will introduce him, <laughs> Rudy Schedler, who is with us, the director of the Swiss Museum of Games, archaeologist, and partner of the Locus Studio Project. So we welcome Cameron uh, Brown um, today. He uh, is uh, uh, at the head of another ERC, European Research Council uh, project, um, Archaeology of the Digital Ludim uh, Project. Um, uh, Cameron, he uh, contacted me, I think, about some three or four years ago when he was uh, thinking about uh, doing, this, uh, doing this project, when he was about to, to write up his uh, uh, dossier to, uh, to send to the European Research Council. And we discussed uh, what he wanted to do and uh, the way he would uh, um, present it to the European Research Council. Uh, beforehand, and of course we are um, we are very happy uh, that the European Research Council practically uh, more or less at the same time accepted several projects about games. There's another project about games uh, going on at um, in Denmark uh, at the University of Copenhagen, uh, but they are more um, uh, into uh, digital uh, games and to. Uh, video games and uh, things like that. Then there is our project about uh, um, games in ancient Greece and Rome, and Cameron's project now uh, about uh, uh, traditional traditional games. Um, so this marks also, uh, or this is a very important to note, because obviously the European Research Council understood in the meantime that uh, games is, has, has become uh, um, um, an important uh, subject uh, for uh, scientific research. This was not the case 20 years ago. Uh, um, if you came up with a project like this, I think they would not have uh, accepted it. Uh, but um, in the meantime, things have changed. So um, Cameron, uh, with his team, uh, one, uh, uh, one of his collaborators is Walter Christ, who already collaborated also with Alexander uh, de Vogt uh, and others. Walter Christ is also uh, uh, um, part of the um, board game studies uh, group, um, who organizes uh, every year uh, the colloquium. So we have a, quite a competent uh, team here, and of course he is surrounded by um, um, by technicians uh, who are able to uh, uh, to program what uh, they are doing. The the major the uh, the subject is to uh, study traditional games, their evolution, and perhaps their general genealogy um, uh, and uh, their distribution, of course. Now, last April, Cameron already uh, invited uh, several uh, people to a first workshop um, in uh, Germany, where for two days uh, we discussed uh, several issues uh, of this uh, project. And I think you will uh, talk a little bit about it uh, today also. Yeah. There were a lot of questions, uh, because uh, we started with discussion with, by discussing what is a traditional game, you know, how do you which games would you enter, uh, what makes a game a traditional game, and uh, the problem also of mapping. We discussed the problem of mapping uh, the games also. It did, um, um, uh, but he will certainly uh, talk about it in, uh, in more detail. Um, so I'm looking forward to, uh, and, uh, to the discussion and also to the next workshop we are planning actually, um, maybe uh, that which takes place or in, uh, in autumn or in early next year. So welcome. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, I'm Cameron. I'm a computer scientist from Maastricht University. Um, I'll be presenting my digital learning project and my apologies, I'll ripple have seen much of this before. Um, 
So games are ubiquitous. All humans play games, and all human cultures have their own games. And games typically reflect um, the cultures in which they're played. Uh, games potentially offer us a window of insight onto our cultural past, but the problem is that the rule sets for ancient games were rarely recorded. Games have typically been passed on by oral tradition, uh, which on the plus side means that we do have a huge variety of games today, but on the downside it, knows, it means that we know very little about how those games were actually played. Uh, games are cultural artefacts that provide touch points between cultures, and one use of games is as evidence of cultural contact. For example, here we have two games. On the left we have a game played in ancient Mexico called Patoli, and on the right is a traditional game from India. And you can see that the boards are strikingly similar. They're both in this cross shape, they're played in a track around the arms, and both games have special cells marked towards the end of the arms. So it seems very unlikely that two such different cultures would come up with the same game board independently. So in 1879, this was seen as evidence of early pre-Columbian culture uh, contact between these two cultures. But 70 years later, uh, this was disputed by Erasmus as being coincidence. Uh, the idea that there are only so many game boards that can be designed, so inevitably there would be some um, coincidental reinvention of the same boards. Now, 70 years later, um, we're none the wiser, and the aim of my project is to hopefully provide some insight into these sorts of problems. So we have a lot of archaeological evidence of games uh, throughout history, and from around the world, dating back um, about five and a half thousand years. So these provide clues which which we can make reconstructions, uh, but reconstruction is still a very subjective endeavor and quite unreliable. So the aim of this project is to um, help make better reconstructions and a better understanding of how games develop throughout history. Uh, the project is funded by the European Research Commission it's a five-year project, and it's essentially a computational study of the world's traditional games. We treat games as mathematical entities, so we use a quantitative and evidence-based approach. The objectives of the project are to model the full range of traditional strategy games in a single playable database so they can be compared. We want to reconstruct missing knowledge about ancient games more reliably, and we want to map the spread of games throughout history. Uh, so the ultimate aim is to improve our understanding of traditional games using the available evidence and modern AI techniques. The team mostly consists of computer scientists, uh, myself, Eric, Matthew, and Dennis, and we've recently been joined by Walter Christ, uh, he's an anthropologist and archaeologist specialising in the dispersal of games. And Walter's role is to help us identify the important games, to identify the evidence we need, and to make sure we get the right evidence and that we interpret it correctly. The scope of games we're looking at are traditional games of strategy. Um, it's hard to define exactly what traditional means in this context, but we're working with the definition that the game has no proprietary owner, it has some historical longevity, and it has some connection with the local culture. And a game is deemed to be a game of strategy if it rewards mental skill over physical skill, and in which good decisions beat bad decisions. Uh, this will mostly be board games, but will also include some tile games, card games, dice games, and so on. And the ultimate aim of the project is to model the thousand most important traditional games throughout history. So these are games that can be documented, located and dated, and games that have some impact on the evolutionary record. Uh, there'll be non-strategy games that are important, uh, such as snakes and ladders, that will be included uh, because they have some impact on the evolutionary record. So here's a timeline of what Walter identifies as the 50 most important games throughout history uh, for the context of this study. 
you can see a progression of games, starting with um, the early games in Egypt, uh, through Mesopotamia, through Asia, and up through Europe. So the time scale that we're looking at is a bit before 3000 BC, um, up to around 1875. That seems to be the tipping point when games uh, became more proprietary rather than traditional. So there'll be some games beyond 1875, but most of them will be um, in this earlier period. And as you can see, there are large gaps where we don't have much evidence at all. So um, the physical evidence that we have of the boards and so on, they provide the tangi tangible cultural heritage that we're dealing with. And in this project, we'll be trying to um, develop the intangible cultural heritage in terms of the rules and the social and cultural context. Um, the aim being to restore this information as much as we can and to preserve it. The available evidence that we're dealing with, um, if we look back at the earliest known board games, these are Meehan and Senate from Egypt. Uh, Meehan at the top, no rules have ever found, been found for this game. Um, we have the boards and the pieces, but nobody really knows how this game was played. As for Senate, uh, we have hundreds of complete sets that have been found. This example was found in Tutankhamun's tomb. But again, we have no rules from the original players for how these games were played. And the only clues we have for these games are from hieroglyphic art. Uh, with Senate, we often see hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic art with two players and showing um, different starting positions and different uh, piece types. So we can assume there were two types of pieces. And the board has several special symbols on it. But um, depending on the region, these will often be different. There'll be a different number of special symbols. There'll be different symbols in different locations. So it's hard to tell how these uh, symbols actually work within the game. And we currently have about a dozen plausible reconstructions of Senate. The oldest known rule sets we have uh, come from the Sumerian clay tablets from 177 BC. The tablet at the top was one of about 130,000 catalogued in the British Museum. <coughs> and these aren't large stone tablets. They're about the size of your palm with very small writing, very difficult to read. The tablet at the bottom was actually destroyed in the 1940s when the Prisian Photographer's Studio was bombed, but luckily a photograph survived. And somehow Irving Finkel, a curator at the British Museum, put these two together and recognised that these described the rules of an ancient game. The game was uh, 20 squares, and the rules have been applied to an earlier game, which is the ancestor of 20 squares, called the Royal Game of Ur. Uh, this game was first played in Mesopotamia <coughs> in 2600. Um, but notice that there are large gaps in the timeline. Uh, the game was played 2,000 years before the tablets were written, and the tablets were reconstructed about 2,000 years later. So even though we have the rules for this game, uh, there's still some interpretation, and it's not entirely certain uh, which playing track uh, the game was played on. And even for games much more recent for which we have the rules, we have um, reasonably complete knowledge and we have living players, um, errors can still creep in. So here's a game from uh, New Zealand from the 18th century called Mu Torea. So this is a very simple game in which um, players take turns moving a piece to the empty space and a player wins if their opponent has no legal moves. Now there's a critical rule in this game that you can only move a piece that is adjacent to an enemy piece. So a game might progress like this. Um, unfortunately, at least two historical records omit this rule 
and allow any piece to be moved. So what happens in this case is the first player wins on first move, game over. So this obviously isn't how the game is played, and the simplest analysis would show that. Uh, here's a game tree expansion. This is the complete game tree for this game. It's very simple. And these dotted lines uh, show that with the wrong rule set, the game ends after one move. Uh, so the point is that even though we have reasonably complete knowledge about this game, uh, these sorts of errors still occur quite frequently. Uh, there's also the problem of invented traditions. Uh, here's a game from Aboriginal Australia, which has been marketed as a traditional game from the, the tribe it was played in. However, this game is identical to a European game called Small Merrills. And it's obviously a clear outlier, as um, no other strategy board game occurs in Australian Aboriginal culture. And this game has actually been traced to either Afghani camel herders who brought the game in from Asia, or a German missionary who used to play games with the, um, the tribe. And another case I'm very interested in is a game called Surakarta. Um, it's named after the traditional Javanese capital and is often described as the national game of Java, uh, but no one can find anybody in Java who knows the game. <laughs> and it's possible that this game was invented for, uh, by Ravensburger, uh, a German game company in 1972. And I have recently met an Indonesian student who's doing a project with me who thinks his grandfather might know this game. Mm -hmm. So I'll be very interested to see what he finds out. Uh, so we have a lot of evidence, but it's incomplete and unreliable. And the approach we're taking is to quantify this evidence where possible to digitize it and encode it in a single consistent format to establish the historical and cultural context and then to find relationships between the data. So we're treating games as structures of ludemes. Uh, ludemes are game memes which are units of game-related information. They're essentially the building blocks for the DNA of games. So they encapsulate the key concepts of games. Uh, so here we have two simple ludemes. One describes a square tiling, and another describes something of size three. We can put these into a larger structure, which is still a ludeme. So we now have, have a board. So square tiling, size three. And here we have an even larger structure. This is also a ludeme describing a complete game. We have two players, square board size three. Players move their own piece to an empty cell, and they win with three in a row. And does anybody recognize this game? Um, uh, Tic-tac-toe. Yep, this is Tic-tac-toe. So a benefit of using this approach is it describes games in very simple concepts that most people recognize. And it's a very simple and flexible way to describe games. Um, on the other hand, this is the game description language that's typically used in academic game studies. Uh, this is the same game, Tic-Tac-Toe, described in the GDL. It's been the academic standard for the last 15 years. Um, but I really don't think this is a, a good way to describe games. It's essentially the programmer's view of a game. These are the instructions for updating the game state directly. So what we lack is we don't have the, the game concepts. They're, um, they're, they're very much sort of embedded in the code. So by comparison, here we have the two games side by side. Uh, just say we want to change the size of the board. In the ludemic approach, we just change this parameter. But in GDL, we have to rewrite all this code for the new board type. Similarly, if we want to change the um, tiling from square to hexagonal, uh, we just change this parameter. But with GDL, we have to rewrite the code again to show the new board geometry. And if we wanted to change the, um, the ending rule from a line of three to a play winning if they have no moves, um, again, it's just a new ludeme. Whereas in GDL, we'd have to rewrite half the code. 
so the eudemic approach it um, describes games in very simple conceptual um, units and this is how game designers think about games when they design games and I think this is the only way that we can realistically um, define the full range of games that we need for the study. Uh, we've implemented about 400 Ludemes so far and I think around 600 should be sufficient. So there aren't actually that many Ludemes. Um, what you find is any game will typically have the same basic rules, the same basic Ludemes, just used in different combinations. So how do we use this approach to improve reconstructions? Uh, given a rule set, what we will do is we will search for alternative rule sets that maximise the historical authenticity of the rules with the quality of the resulting game. So to uh, match the historical authenticity, we're looking at the location, the period and the cultural context in which those rules were used uh, based on the historical data that we're gathering. And to measure game quality, we're running self-play trials between AI agents and we're looking for obvious flaws and other indicators of game quality. So the main flaws uh, used to indicate bad games are bias. Uh, generally, all players should have an equal chance of winning. So if the game is biased towards one player, that's usually not a good sign. Uh, games should not be too drawish. Most games should produce a result. And game length is actually a very good indicator. Games shouldn't be too short, uh, such as the, the flawed Mutare rule set. And neither should games go on for too long. Uh, so these metrics, they're easy to measure, easy to detect, and it lets us eliminate bad rule sets quite quickly. Uh, the system that we're developing is called Ludi. It's a general game system. Uh, we have about 200 games modelled so far, but we'll eventually have the full 1,000 historical games plus um, at least another 1,000 modern games. The official release is soon, hopefully in two or three weeks. Um, but if you're interested, you can download a pre-release version and play around with it. Uh, here's an example of how we might apply Ludi. Uh, this is an ancient game, Nefertapel or Viking chess, uh, played in Scandinavia from 800 AD. Again, the original rule set uh, for this game has never been found. The first record we have of the rules for this game are uh, when Linnaeus saw the related game of Tablut being played and he notated the rules in Latin. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a very systematic description, it was just a flow of consciousness sort of description. And when this was translated into English, um, a problem crept in. So the game was translated into English 1811. Then a century later, uh, this translated rule set appeared in Murray's History of Chess. It became the Shaco rule set, but it contained a critical error. Uh, Smith made this um, bad translation of the phrase, likewise the king. So the way he translated this phrase, sorry, the original phrase was likewise the king, which meant that the king was captured the same as the men were captured, uh, being flanked on two sides by enemy pieces. But um, Smith's translation was except the king. So in this case, the king had to be surrounded on all four sides. Uh, this made the king very hard to capture and biased the game towards the king's side. So here's Ludi and here's Nefertapel. Um, in this game, the pieces slide along lines, they move as rooks, and if a piece, if a man flanks another man on two sides, that man is captured whereas the king has to be flanked on all four sides. <coughs> so in the original Latin rule set, what we see is a reasonably fair game. 
Uh, so what you're seeing here is two AI agents playing the game with three seconds thinking time per move. The arrows indicate um, pardon me. The arrows indicate the AI's thought processes uh, for that piece, where the colour of the arrow indicates whether it thinks it's a strong move or a weak move. Uh, blue moves are positive, good moves. Red moves are weaker, losing moves. And the size of the arrow indicates how much time the AI is thinking on that move. So what you should see is the AI making the move corresponding to the largest, bluest arrow. And what we see is some good moves, some bad moves. But in general, we have this, uh, this purplish average uh, move evaluation. So these were for the original Latin rules from Linnaeus. Now if we look at the English translation with the flawed rules, we see a much clearer bias. So from the very first move, the attacking side, the black pieces, um, estimate that they will lose this game, and the white pieces estimate they will win the game. So within seconds, we can see that there's a bias, and that this rule set is probably flawed. So the range of complexity for the games that we're looking at, um, Mood Torre is one of the simplest games with a very simple game tree, and this is the most complex. Uh, this game, Taikyoku Shogi, um, actually exists. At least um, two sets uh, are in existence, and it has actually been played by humans. Um, I think it's the most complex board game that has ever been played by humans. It involves 402 pieces each, with more than 200 different piece types that players need to know. And the resolution isn't good enough. Oops. Uh, but each piece is defined by two kanji symbols. And on the back of each piece, there's another two kanji symbols. So when a piece is captured, it's flipped and put back into the game. So this is a very hard game for humans to play, with an average of 800 legal moves per turn and about 1,000 turns per game. Um, Go is generally considered the most complex board game, but its uh, state space complexity is nothing uh, compared to this game. And again, we can play that in Ludi. I think this shows the benefit of the ludemic approach. Um, I don't think this game could be described in any other system. Um, it's never been implemented before, but it actually wasn't that difficult uh, to implement in the system. <coughs> and what you are seeing isn't much better uh, than random play. Uh, the game is so complex that we get about one play out per second with the Monte Carlo simulations, uh, which is not enough to do any useful analysis. So instead, we would use alpha beta search for this game. And again, the game is so complex that we're only getting search depths of one or two ply, which would normally be very weak. Um, but this game is so complex that I think this AI would beat any human player. This would be very difficult to beat. The movements of the pieces um, include 
um, almost every conceivable type of move, including these very powerful pieces that can move in a line as far as they want, uh, capturing both friendly and enemy pieces as they go. The, um, the project plan. Uh, we're approaching the two-year mark, so we're just about to release the, the Ludi system, and we'll continue adding loadings as needed, and we'll continue developing the game database. And in the next three years, we'll be looking at the phylogenetic aspect and the cultural mapping aspect of the project. So, in terms of the cultural uh, transmission theorem theory, games. Uh, act as vehicles for the transmission of ideas, which are transferred from person to person. So the ludemes are the packages that are transmitted. Uh, these are essentially the DNA of games. And this allows us to develop a ludemic distance, which is the number of steps required to change one game into another. There are two main types of ludemic distance. Uh, the first is the genotypic distance. This is based on the form of the game and is measured directly from the, the game description, from the rules, the geometry, and so on. And the phenotypic distance is based on the function. Uh, this, these are the trends that emerge during play, where you actually have to play the game out uh, to measure this distance. So once we have this ludemic distance, we can use this in lieu of an actual genetic distance to perform follow genetic analysis. And we'll be doing this to develop our family trees for the key um, uh, game families to perform ancestral state reconstruction, uh, which will hopefully let us identify um, ludeme structures that ancestral games um, most likely contained. And it might even let us find missing links uh, that are games that might explain some gap in the evolutionary record, but for which we don't have any evidence. Another thing we want to look at in the project is whether games can be related to the dispersal of mathematical ideas. So we'll be looking at charting the spread of games and the underlying <coughs> mathematical concepts uh, that they contain throughout history. Um, we'll be doing this by tagging each ludine with the math mathematical concepts that it embodies. This will give a mathematical profile for each game. And the underlying insight here is that all games embody underlying mathematical concepts, even if they're not that obvious. For the mapping tasks, we're using Geochron. Uh, this is a geotemporal database, which provides yearly maps for the last 5,000 years, covering uh, more than 2,000 cultures. Uh, the basic operation is that we provide a GPS and a date for each piece of evidence and Geochron will tell us uh, the civilization, nation, historical landmarks and events uh, that happened at that point and that date. So this um, will let us chart the spread of games and ludemes throughout history. Uh, we'll be correlating these with trade routes, explorer routes and so on. And Geochron have provided um, around 275 routes already. Uh, for example, here's a very important route in the history of games. This is the Silk Road trade route. Um, this will be used for um, charting the dispersal of games from the Fertile Crescent through to Asia. Um, in terms of data gathering, uh, we're getting data mostly from um, online research and archival work. Uh, the sources are mostly artefacts, rule texts, artwork descriptions, ethnography, and historical accounts. We're collecting a range of data for each piece of evidence, and importantly, we're assigning a confidence to each piece of data. So this will be used. Um, so 
so we can get a probabilistic model of how um, accurate our reconstructions are likely to be. Uh, this is the, um, the format that we're storing the data in. We're storing for each um, item the name of the game, the variance, the period the game is known to be played in, the region, cross-references with known evidence, and the sources. Um, and again, we're assigning a confidence to each um, piece of data. So the database allows us to generate some um, evidence maps, uh, which are interactive plots that show the um, piece, pieces of evidence we have for the game color-coded by date. Um, each data point describes either evidence about the rules of the game or evidence from where the game was played or when it was played. And our goal is to have at least one data point per game. So each data point is based on an artifact, a piece of artwork, a historical text, literary illusion or ethnographic description. Um, the data points can be GPS coordinates or regions, and we list the sources and the uh, confidence as a percentage. So here's our game database. We have about uh, 440 games so far and we've implemented rule sets for about half of them. Uh, here's the game 20 squares. We have 106 pieces of evidence for this game. So for this game we can see that it originated around Mesopotamia, spread through the Levant, down through Egypt, and back up north. Um, pardon me. These pawn symbols um, indicate evidence of actual game pieces or boards. We can click on each one for the relevant information. Uh, for the source and for the confidence in that piece of evidence. is the game we have the most evidence for. We have 400 pieces of evidence. Mostly localised in Egypt and Cyprus. Um, and here are some different types of evidence. Uh, this indicates the evidence is artwork. This is actual archaeological evidence of pieces or boards. And this is archival evidence. So we're still in the early stages of developing the database. Uh, we have lots of data for a few games, but for most games, um, as you can see, we don't have the rule sets for any evidence. Uh, this is what we will be building up over the next couple of years. And 
Another outcome of the project will be to establish a new field of research called digital archaeology. Um, on the one hand, we have traditional game studies with wealth of historical analysis, uh, but typically very little mathematical analysis of the games. And on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of research currently being done in game AI, but this is all mathematical uh, research with very little um, respect for the historical context. So the aim of digital archaeology is to bridge the gap between these two research fields. OK, I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this uh, overview and uh, presentation of some of the first uh, results of the project. So we have uh, some time now for a discussion. Um, are we still connected with the... Uh, yes, then we can ask the question to whatever yeah. we manage somehow. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, questions and remarks. Also, first, thank you very much for coming. It's very important that we meet and change about our common results. And uh, I was, um, we, we will talk about, we will talk with Alric as well as with Elton, how informatically we could somehow relate our results because we're also producing a map. And somehow it would be really a great benefit if we could fit somehow. Uh, but this we must discuss informatically how it works, uh, maybe behind the scene. <laughs> but it would be a really a great benefit. Okay. So, uh, in your map system, you have a lot of uh, historic historical evidence mm -hmm. uh, that we, we saw in the map. Mm -hmm. um, that's only your team that um, manage this data, or are you open for other researchers? Um, yeah, only Walter uh, at the moment. Yes. Um, he's setting up. <coughs> pardon, he's setting up the database. Um, it's, it'll be open access. Uh, the database can be downloaded or queried by anybody. Okay. And we will allow our contributions from other users. Um, Walter will probably curate that and just sort of check the entries okay. uh, before they're actually added to the database. Yep. But hopefully it will be collaborative. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. mm -hmm. yeah. But the same by us. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Sampo has launched the database with Alric, and uh, you will see what uh, was on now, how many we had, I don't remember, but uh, quite a number, mm -hmm. and making tests, mm -hmm. uh, making tests of use. And again, it will be open access, but we really need to be interested to see how it could go. And the kind of map you produce are geographical maps. Yep, yep. Yes. Yeah, we <coughs> still haven't um, decided what the final visualizations will be. Yeah. Uh, somehow we want to show the games and the ludines spreading geographically throughout history. Yeah. yeah. I think it will be interesting to see uh, when um, uh, as an interesting tool to to make uh, or to have uh, AI mm -hmm. agents play the game. Uh, or in thousands of thousands of games, so you, you can analyze uh, in depth uh, the rule set. Mm. And um, I think this is uh, quite an important tool we have now to, uh, to test uh, reconstructions of rules already. And to see also, for example, for the famous um, uh, Suvakata case, mm. um, whether or not uh, the, 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 the rules um, fit into the cultural uh, context uh, in Indonesia. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe the two teams um, are completely absent from from this region or whatever or from the time and so one might be able to find out if this is whether or not this is a Ravensburger invention uh -huh. or a real traditional game. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah hopefully it should be a useful tool yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, s I saw you, you had multiple uh, agents for you, the, the AI mm -hmm. of the video games. Yeah. Uh, do you use machine learning for some of them? Uh, yes, we do, yep. Okay. Um, the most general agent is based on Monte Carlo playouts. Okay. Um, so you don't actually need any knowledge of the game. You can just play the game out and use the results to, to fine tune it. 
Uh, but like for the giant shogi, the playouts are so slow that those approaches don't work. So we have to fall back to traditional um, alpha beta search, mm -hmm. for which you need to know some knowledge about the game. So we use machine learning to fine tune the weights for the heuristics, uh, the material count, mobility, uh, proximity to goal, those sort of measurements. Okay. Um, we're also learning features. Um, for example, in a game in which you want to make a line of four but not a line of three, uh, we could learn these features. So if we see this pattern, we want to play here, um, but we don't want to make a line of three. So if we see this pattern, we don't want to play here or here. And these give some insight into the strategy um, for playing the game. And I think this might be a way to automatically extract strategies from a game so we can explain them uh, in human comprehensible terms. So that's uh, another side benefit of the machine learning. Okay. Thank you. What is also interesting is the mathematical aspect, I think. This is uh, really uh, an interesting case uh, or interesting field of study to see the mathematical concepts behind, uh, behind the games. Mm -hmm. Um, this may might also help us to uh, to better understand whether or not these famous uh, seventh millennium or eighth millennium uh, board games Olafsson uh, took for game boards, um, whether or not these are really game boards. Whether at that time, whether at that time, eighth millennium BC, certain mathematical concepts were already uh, around or not. Mm -hmm. you know? This is a big discussion with these. Uh, there are several stone game boards with holes in it that date to the 8th millennium BC, and uh, uh, some people think that might be the oldest uh, uh, board games uh, survived. Uh, but then we have a big gap between 8th millennium and uh, the 4th millennium BC. And as I saw, that Walter Quist doesn't believe in. Uh, this theory. No. Um, he starts in, uh, with Mehen and, uh, and Senate in Egypt, of course. Yeah. But of course, the mathematical concepts <laughs> might uh, might help us to to, to decide uh, whether or not uh, something could have been a game already at that time uh, or not. Okay. And what's your take on it? Do you think they might have been games? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. No, I, don't, I don't think so. And regarding the mathematics of games, um, there are games where the mathematics is very obvious, uh, such yeah. as Rhythmomachia. Um, but it is based on a mathematical theory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but almost every aspect of the game, when you look at it, has a mathematical mm -hmm. basis underneath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're mathematical entities. And, and what about the use of boards for as a backing? Do you as, uh, what about the use of boards as a backing to calculate? Ah, okay. Do you consider that or not at all when you speak about the mathematical profile? Do um, you know it can be used in various ways. We haven't taken that into account, okay. but if it can be phrased as a game, then we can certainly model it in the system. <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be worth doing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. Okay. Um, the question is, why should one, you, you, you compared your system of programming, mm -hmm. uh, implementing uh, the games with the other one, the GPL or what? GPL. Yeah. Yeah. Why should one use the other one when it is far more simple to use your uh, system? Um, why should you do this uh, on the right side? The reason for using this system is what you're seeing is the actual instructions for updating the game state. This is the lowest level at which you can describe the game. Um, so as a computer scientist, this is very comforting because you know exactly what's going on. Um, it means we can do proofs about this rule set, whether the goal can always be reached and so on. Whereas the Ludemic description, it um, essentially hides the implementation underneath uh, 
these okay. keywords. Okay. So that's the main difference. Okay. Um, but if you're designing a game, I don't know any game designer who has ever used this system for that purpose. It's only been for academic research. <coughs> this approach is much, much better for designing a game. Um, it took Eric about a week to implement the Takia Gushogi mm -hmm. to define it in this method would take about three or four thousand pages of logic code. It would take several years. Mm -hmm. It'll be a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, I think research interest in this approach has pretty much dried up now. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. that um, researchers will take note of the polydemic yeah. approach from now on. Yeah. Of course, the, uh, uh, this um, uh, giant uh, shogi version is, uh, is quite an interesting uh, case uh, to study. But is this a traditional? Was the, is this a traditional game? Um, well, two sets exist in museums in Japan. Yeah. Um, it has been played. It wasn't played widely. It might just even be like a, a theoretical game that someone devised just to show how mm -hmm. far games can be taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, certainly not very popular. Uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, about this game, mm -hmm. uh, is your system able to calculate how many times it will take to play this game? How, how many times, how many time you need to play this game? Is the system able to evaluate the uh, for, for what purpose? Sorry. Uh, if this game is played, yep. How long it would take? How long it would take? Um, yeah, we can do random playouts, but they can be quite misleading. Yeah. Um, intelligent playouts also it depends what level the AI is at. Um, but yes, we can play the game out and do some analysis on it. Um, Yes. So this takes 30 seconds, but what it's doing, it's playing a number of uh, random playouts and measuring characteristics like number of moves, average game length, and so on. And then it gives an estimate of the, the game tree complexity, um, which is the number of decisions that players need to explore to play the game. So this will just take a few seconds. And for the smaller games, uh, we can do full game tree expansions. So we have perfect knowledge about these games. And we should be able to do quite thorough analyses. But for the larger games, it really um, depends on the level of AI. Mm -hmm. It's a very unusual element. It is, so it is, it is, uh, as a matter of fact, it is interesting to, 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 to include the game in, mm -hmm. in the um, uh, in a project like like this, since it uh, it bears some very unusual elements that are hard to find uh, in other games. For example, a piece that can capture own pieces yep. on its way and can capture more than one piece mm -hmm. uh, on its way. This is uh, rather unusual. It's uh, difficult to yeah. find another game with, with this uh, kind of uh, I think element. they systematically tried to find every combination of rules a piece could make. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Uh, what, what I found also very interesting, and this must be crossed with the knowledge, of course, of, of Ulrich, is that we have regularly debates about identifying uh, designs as proper games or not, being something else. And when I look at this, of course, I think of a famous topos marker of a thesis. It could then be a game, if I understand. Okay. But uh, that's where we, we are planning a, a workshop about uh, identifying games, so looking at all those that are a bit stuck in the air because mm -hmm. we don't know, shall we take them or not, and what kind of rules can we imagine, and so this will be very fruitful to be yeah. put together for that. At the moment we record everything, yeah? we must mm -hmm. record everything following the scheme of Charlotte Rouge, maybe expanding it, uh, and uh, but just describing the, the design and only at the last stage proposing an identification. And uh, 
that would be interesting to get the light of what you can find as dynamics, possible dynamics with simple designs like these ones. Yeah. Okay. One point is, of course, that we might, what is a, a could be, what would be a, uh, a point is to include our mapping of uh, Greek and Roman games into. Of course. They're connecting somehow. Yeah. Connecting. Yeah. Yeah. So they would, uh, the Greek and Roman games would appear in your mapping too. Yeah, so and that would be a, a very thorough mapping. Yeah. So in, I say so because you, you, if we, we would agree that we could do this, you know, you, Walter would not have to do all this work yeah. again. You know, uh, exactly. so it do, doesn't need to do this. Uh, he can concentrate on other games uh, instead of Greek and Roman because we do the Greek and Roman and yeah, could be very insert nice. it uh, to, uh, into the project. Uh, or, or, or yes, and so fortunately <laughs> our information is here, so how <laughs> 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 concretely this could be done yeah. and uh, <coughs> what is behind the scene, but uh, we don't know. <laughs> and are you focusing exclusively on Greek and Roman games? Yes. yes. <laughs> Okay, I uh, would think we have, uh, have a little yes, we have break. Yes, we have a